Today we're speaking with Dr. Eric Weiner, Director of Breast Oncology Center and the Thompson Senior Investigator in Breast Cancer Research at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He is also Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chief Scientific Advisor and Chair of Komen's Scientific Advisory Board. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Weiner. Thanks for having me here. One third of women who qualify for screening under today's guidelines are not being screened. Why is this? Well, there are many different reasons, of course. Um, some women legitimately choose not to have screening, and, and that is always someone's right. Um, I think the more concerning group are women who aren't able to afford screening because their insurance won't cover it for some reason, or more commonly because they're uninsured. And there are many groups in the U.S., including Komen, who have tried very hard to, to, to provide screening to women who are uninsured and underinsured. Um, and then finally, apart from the issue of, of, of coverage for screening, um, there are women who perhaps if reminded by their doctors would have screening and where, for whatever reasons, screening falls through the cracks. And, you know, that happens in all of our lives. And I think that we just need to do our best to remind women, particularly women who fall within groups where we know that screening is beneficial, to, to pursue that screening. Your team at the Breast Oncology Center at Dana-Farber is working on novel agents, clinical trials, and studies that would improve the experience for women with breast cancer. What, from your perspective, are the key advances in these areas? Well, I think there's little question that the greatest advances have occurred in the setting of HER2-positive breast cancer over the course of the past decade. When trastuzumab first became available for HER2-positive breast cancer, I don't think that any of us realized, based on the results of the trials at that time, just how big an effect it would have in terms of the course of, of HER2-positive breast cancer. We know that women with advanced HER2-positive breast cancer live longer and live better as a result of HER2-directed therapy, which now not only includes trastuzumab, but includes uh, drugs like lapatinib. And of course, trastuzumab has played a major role over the course of the past five years in preventing recurrences in women with early stage disease. There are now a whole new class of anti-HER2 agents that are being developed, several of which I think are within a year or two or three of being commercially available. So I, I think that really the, the, the future is quite bright for patients who have HER2 positive breast cancer. Unfortunately, our advances in other areas to date have still been somewhat more limited. We're all very hopeful about targeted therapy for patients with, with so-called triple negative breast cancer, and in particular, the PARP inhibitors have um, been of, of great interest there. And I should mention that, that the PARP inhibitors are not only of interest for women with triple negative breast cancer, but perhaps also uh, for women who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, whether or not the, 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 the cancer is triple negative or not. There are other targets uh, that have been looked at for triple negative breast cancer, um, in particular some of the EGFR inhibitors, um, and now there's interest in PI3 kinase inhibitors uh, for patients with triple negative breast cancer. And finally, for the very large group of women who have estrogen receptor positive and HER2 negative breast cancer, while the advances in terms of targeted therapies have been more modest, we've been able to understand this group of tumors better than we did 10 and 15 years ago. And in particular, in women with early stage estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, I think we are far more selective in terms of the group of women who receive chemotherapy to prevent a recurrence. And what that has allowed us to do is administer therapy to women who are going to benefit the most from it and really avoid chemotherapy in a large group of women who are unlikely to gain benefit. Our group at Dana-Farber, and for that matter, many groups around the country and around the world are working very hard to develop 
new targeted therapies and, and to sort out where they will be most beneficial for women with breast cancer. It's a big challenge, and as we understand just how heterogeneous breast cancer is, we realize that running many of these trials will be a complex process, and I think it underscores the fact that groups like ours are going to have to reach out and work with groups uh, around the country and around the world, and I, I should mention that um, one opportunity to do that has actually been through our Stand Up to Cancer collaboration that that AACR has, of course, been very, very involved in. And in our collaboration, where we're working with centers around the country, as well as with uh, Val de Braun in, in Barcelona, we've been exploring the PI3 kinase inhibitors in, in women with breast cancer, as well as um, women with endometrial and ovarian cancer. Would you speak a little bit about your general thoughts on progress in this field? I think progress. Um, has occurred, I don't think there's any question about that. I think that women with breast cancer are living better and, and um, many are living, many who used to live shorter lives are living longer. A greater proportion of women are being cured of breast cancer who were not cured before. And again, that's particularly true in women who have HER2 positive breast cancer. But I think it's hard not to feel a little frustration in terms of the pace of improvement. We all feel like this is a time when there's been really an explosion in our understanding of the underlying biology of breast cancer. And it's very important that we not view this as a problem that has been completely or even partially solved. We have to recognize that there are still 40,000 women dying each year from breast cancer. And there's a real urgency in terms of the, the work that we do. Um, again, it's going to take partnerships across academic organizations or institutions. It's going to take partnerships between pharmaceutical companies and academia. And I also believe, and I believe this very strongly, that we, we need to convince the regulatory authorities um, to take uh, perhaps a slightly different approach than has been traditionally taken um, when it comes to drug approval. Um, I personally think that the threshold to get drugs approved should be lowered, but at the same time, we need to monitor very closely what's going on with a drug once it's approved and be flexible about altering that approval over time. It just takes too long to get drugs from the development stage to the clinic for more routine use, and we've got to do something to shorten that process. Dr. Weiner, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.